So it's all very well using a series of equations, perhaps s over t is equal to v, or maybe v minus u over t uh, is equal to the acceleration, okay? These are all very well, but they don't really tell us about what happens in real life. So this video here was uh, I shot a couple of weeks ago when I was out on my bike in the woods, uh, sort of uh, the start of my New Year's resolutions on the, the 1st of January. And what I had in my pocket was my mobile phone just running an app called Strava but there's a, quite a few other available. And what it does is it make, takes huge amounts of data and it records your position every fraction of a second. And although um, it, it definitely felt fast and maybe it looked in the video and it was, it was pretty muddy, um, I couldn't really tell at the time how I got on. But one of the great things about this data is that on any kind of phone, you can get uh, loads of information about how you've got on. So if I wanted to maybe analyze my effort, what I have here, is a map of how I got on. There's maybe the kind of the elevation uh, across on this graph here, and the other graph shows my speed at different times. So I can look at section by section how fast I went, and also I can maybe compare this to other people. And what we have here is a great way of visualizing what can be quite a complicated effect. And this here is a brilliant example of a speed time graph. To represent this motion, we can think about two main sorts of graphs. We have a distance time graph, so the distance measured in meters and the time measured in seconds. And this basically shows maybe how an object um, varies its distance with respect to time. And what we find with a distance time graph, because distance is a cumulative thing, you can't go, you can't take any less steps. All you can do is every step you take just adds to the previous amount. We find that we get something maybe a bit like this. So this is a distance time graph that you should be fairly familiar with. Now, the gradient of this graph is gonna be equal to the change in y by the change in x, uh, so by the change in y by the change in x value. So the distance is gonna be the value of x, uh, x representing distance this time, and we've got t over here. So the gradient is gonna be equal to the change in x over the change in time. And this, the rate of change of distance is equal to our speed, and this, quite nicely gives rise to a speed time graph. So the speed of an object, because it's a magnitude, must always be a positive value. So we have a speed measured in meters per second and time measured in seconds. And if we maybe sort of think about how the graph above relates to the one beneath it, we have something moving to constant speed. It's then stationary because the gradient is zero, so it hasn't moved anywhere in this time. And this is the only time you can really get away with what looks a bit like a bar chart in physics. We then have another um, speed at this point here, but this gradient is less than that. So maybe they might move at uh, a smaller speed for a certain amount of time before they're stationary once again. And we can really see that this speed time graph is a graph of the gradient of the one up here. Now, a final point to note is that we might know the total distance that something has moved but because the area under the bottom curve can be calculated by looking at the speed multiplied by the time, so the base times the height, it means the area here is equal to the distance traveled. Whereas here, the gradient was equal to the speed.